Welcome back everyone. For our final session today, we're going to look at child support and family assistance. So can I introduce to you, Therese Edwards, the CEO of the National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children, Catherine Eagle, Principal Solicitor of the Welfare Rights and Advocacy Service, and Chris Belcher from the Welfare Rights and Advocacy Service in Perth. You can see Catherine and Chris just getting themselves sorted out there, all ready to go there. Yes, we, yeah, we've just had uh, some issues at work with power and things, so we're at my uh, daughter's place in her bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. We're here. We're here. Okay, I'll uh, hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Um, so I think Therese is going to go first. So we'll, we'll um, yeah, kick off with, the, with the, the best bit first. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and it's great to be here. And I've been listening to the discussion. Um, so first of all, I would like to start with um, letting everyone know that I'm from, I'm speaking on, on Ghana lands today. So uh, definitely respect to all First Nations people. And I always send out a special note of love and care to First Nations single mums. Um, my discussion is very, it's gendered, and I do want to acknowledge that it's binary in that gender, and that's a bit of the, um, you know, just how the child support system seems to go. Now, it's great to see you, Catherine. It's fantastic. And also kudos to all the people who are staying late on a Tuesday afternoon. Well done to you. And if you're joining in after the, um, the meeting, thank, thank you. So I just want to, when I was thinking about the child support system, what I was really wanting to do was come to it from um, a policy lens, a single mother lens, and to give people who are part of the discussion a sense of why there is, it is viewed so often as a system that fatigues people and that it also fails people. So we, we um, there has been an incredible amount of inquiries. So the child support system, I'll take you on a quick pot of history, started in the late 1980s. It, it very much was part of the um, statement around no child should live with poverty. There was a real reckoning that there was entrenched disadvantage in single mother families. Roll on 30 plus years and there is still entrenched disadvantage in single mother uh, families. But child support, I think it can be easily described and, uh, as it is the transfer of, of payments between separated parents and it's to ensure that children are adequately and financially supported. That is the one of the official titles. You, it's a, a significant policy in terms of how many people it can affect and influence. So around 10% of our Australian population, it, it, it can affect and influence about 1 million children and about 1.25 million parents. So we're not talking about a really tiny, um, small service here. It takes a fair bit of work to keep it on the agenda. So um, you may have seen over the years, we, we try really hard to do that. I thought that that heading really captured the sense and that was in a Guardian article and it's very true. When we interview women, they cry and cry and cry because there's a real sense of powerlessness in the, um, in the current situation. And in 2019, working with Swinburne University, we did um, do a national survey. We launched it in Parliament House and it is available online. Um, and we just work really hard to make sure that, that there is, that it's always, always on in the, you know, on the table and, and in front of 
um, the members of parliament. It doesn't mean that we're always successful. Um, child support is one of those policies where it seems to bring out very strong opposing voices from what I would describe as the men's rights groups. And I find the more I speak about child support, the more I seem to get threats and, um, and yeah, thrown my way because there is, there, it is, there seem, when you start talking about the hip pocket and control, that's when we seem to get some of the real difficult um, members of our community who feel that it's time to speak, speak out. More recently, um, and I hope you've seen some of these, is we've been focusing on the tax return. And I'll go into detail as why we were focusing on that. But um, both women who spoke were, were women who um, came through our Facebook page. Both, I was so delighted with what both of them said, but first of all, their willingness. It's really tough and it's quite, quite intimidating to put yourself out there and to talk about child support because it has been framed very uh, way too often that it's, um, you know, very lucrative. Um, women are just trying to live off the, the labour of the guys, that, you know, that women are trying to get what they don't deserve. So it, it's any woman who speaks about child support, I think, we, you know, we just need to acknowledge the framing that they would have been, um, been very aware about. So why this is, this is in thinking of the conference today, I wanted to really, I suppose, lead with the tax returns. And I, and I want to, I describe it as defending the indefensible. So at the moment, we have around a quarter of the child support customers, the payers, mostly blokes, that have not lodged a tax return. And this is despite the levers of Services Australia and the ATO. So what we know through recent um, Senate inquiries that there is around 200,000 um, men with an outstanding tax return on the lower level, and that is for two plus years. What we also know is that there is around 6,000 who haven't lodged their tax return in more than 10 years. And if ever you want something exciting to do and you want to jump on the ATO website late at night, you'll find that there is a statement that says you must lodge an annual tax return or penalties will um, apply. So there's a real disconnect. The other bit that I'd like to share with you is that it is very gendered. So um, probably talking to a group who is fully aware of this, but if women don't lodge an annual tax return or complete the um, portal that's part of the Services Australian system, they don't get their full suite of family payments. So um, there is a there is if you're outside of the child, if you're at, if you're not caring for kids, there seems to be a discretion. If you have responsibility for kids you're compelled so I just want to leave that that point with you now I do um I do want to share a couple of things as to why we've we've ended up here so conditionality has always been on the shoulders of single mums and I go back to 1941 when the widow's pension came in women could not apply and this is for deserted women or women who, whose husbands were infirmed in, in prison was the language. They could not apply for any level of the widow's pay, pension unless they could provide evidence that they had tried to uh, get maintenance. Now, just go back to 1941 and think of the power of the system. 
the lack of ability for women to even find that person. So you can just imagine what would have happened to those women who could not prove to that departmental person beyond um, uh, at the level that that individual who had the discretion did. So we still have, so that was our history. And then the child support system came into play in the 1930s and we still made it conditional. So what we did as, as a society, as, as we went, okay, we now must change the social security law. So if women at the time when child support came into place in 1988, before that was court-based, if they didn't take out a child support agreement, they, they lost access to their pension. Currently, it is the, the impact and the penalty if you don't take out a child support agreement, you lose family payments and rent assistance. So, so it goes, so family payments go to the absolute base amount. What I think would be interesting for the attendees in this group is that women actually file a test that they don't even know is a test. So I don't think many people are aware of the um, maintenance action test. I don't know how many are aware of what the financial penalties are. We don't know the circumstances of the, of the women who make up the 12% who have failed that test. And it's my fear that it would be um, Indigenous women and women whose English is, is, is not their first language. So that, that is why that, that interaction between social security and child support it's, it's through legislation and it, it has a, quite a nasty sting to it. The other bit what I wanted to share, which and I'm sure practitioners have had women come and speak to them about this, is it's also a, one of the enablers around the perpetrator's ability to inflict post-separation harm. So what happens, what does happen and what still happens in the system is because the, because the child support will accept a provisional amount with no evidence, and women are exhausted in telling the, telling the service system that it's not a correct amount, that they have no power over it. So then the child support, which is a, a formula um, amount, imports that provisional amount exports out an amount that is your child support payment and um, and with with no ability for for women to um, to object to that just based upon the belief that they know it is a, it, an incorrect amount the most that they can do is is sending a complaint or um, ask for a change of reasons but substantively it remains and so what happens? Child support gets paid maybe sporadically, but that's the amount that is taken into consideration. And so family payments adjusted upon that. So it's quite conceivable that over a 10, 15 year period, even longer, that women have um, received too much of their family payment, not enough child support, and then what happens is a tax return is lodged. It's usually lodged when the payer has structured their affairs in a way that they won't have to pay any child support. And she's left with a family debt of upwards to 30, 40, 50,000. So that is why we are talking about the, the, the need to only accept exact, timely and accurate information. I always get asked when I start talking about how much the how much is the child support debt. Well, we don't actually know, and I think and it, and it's quite um, it's quite it is it is um, 
Yeah, it, it, it's actually, um, we don't know because people don't want to know. So we, we say that it's around, the recorded amount is 1.6 billion. And I want you to think for the moment of the endless possibilities of what that could do for families if that amount was, was actually paid. But we don't know. And what we did recently in the Select Committee on the Australian Law System was we spoke a lot about the child support debt and how it's opaque and how there's many elements that aren't factored into it. And I've got the I've got what the um, what the committee said, but what was a huge step forward for us was um, we, we managed to get the committee to agree that, that the non-compliance of child support obligations is the equivalent to stealing from children. So that's a significant reframing of the issue. And, um, yeah, we celebrated that one um, with, with a bit of gusto. So, of course, I, uh, not everyone on the committee was happy and that was my interaction with the deputy chair. Uh, it was a cracker of a meeting um, and um, yeah, I, I, the, it was quite an easy, an easy committee to give evidence before because we were running on facts and stacks and she was running on um, on just supporting the men's rights group. So it, it, there was a bit of fun and games at that at that committee, and I think um, the chairperson, who was um, Kevin Andrews, I think she even made him look very progressive. So in child support, there are two different styles of collection. There is agency collect. That's where, as probably what you think, that's where the agency determines the amount and collects the amount. There's the private collect, and we speak about that. That has now become equally and at different points in time when the statistics are taken, even more popular than the agency collect. And why that is so, it's, um, it's promoted as the default for Services Australia. But what I do want to share with you is some of our concerns regarding that, that private collect. So um, mostly, even if women have struggled for years and have, taken, and have accepted maybe a sporadic amount or a, an underpayment here or there, and then they've had enough and they've gone back to agency collect, the most that the agency will collect is three months. So women have been dotted for, for thousands and thousands by entering into the private collect. Some other, just some other bits that, that talks to the gendered process is that you know, 85% are women and 70% have more than 86% of care per year. We also have a really high percentage of child support customers who only have to pay the minimum rate of $10 or less per week. And that's again, because there is great capacity to do the cash in hand, to set up trusts, to minimize your income and to actually just not pay what, what should be. And that is in the context of a really high level of, of child poverty in single mother families. So we know that one in six kids in a single mother family will live in poverty. Now, I'm just going to keep going because I've got some really spicy bits and I don't want to cut into, um, into Catherine, Catherine's time. So some of the things that we're, we're really wanting and join us, like come and join us. So starting with enforcing an annual tax return, not that crazy. Uh, we certainly want to review the harsh interaction so on an amount of just a bit over sixteen hundred dollars per annum received in child support family payments are reduced uh, rent assistance is reduced 
So, so women are getting a really tough gig here. And, there, and the system of calculating that, it's, it, it can be reduced on an assumed amount. And we're trying to get the non-payment of child support to be recognised as financial abuse. Um, this is, I, I just couldn't, I can never do a presentation without sharing with you. I just wanted to let you know that the equivalent of one night per week, so one out of seven, reduces the child support liability by 24%. So basically, if the kids are there every second weekend, nearly a quarter, you know, over a quarter, uh, close to a quarter of the payment is reduced. Still don't know how that works, but that's, that's actually what happens. And in terms of safety, we have this very perverse um, mechanism that, that actually rewards the perpetrator of violence. So the only one protective mechanism that sits in the child support system is for a woman not to collect. And after, you know, 30 plus years of greater awareness and maturity, we've still not updated anything regarding um, protecting women. Um, we, we, we know that women feel disempowered by, by the system and that they get very exhausted by it. We are cheered on every time I talk about child support, women come out and cheer it. And as I said, we, I went to the Australian um, Labor Party uh, women's budget response back in, back in March before, before they won, um, won the election. And I happened to track down Jim, Jim Chalmers as he was trying to exit the room. And I just said to him, I need to talk to you about child support. And if I tell you that child support paid on time and in full reduces child poverty by 21%, can I have your ear? And it was a walk and talk. So that's why it's really important. So I'm here for questions afterwards. And I hope I've given you the broad outline for then for Catherine to come in and um, from her daughter's bedroom to sort it out. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Therese. Um, I'll just share our screen. Is that showing up? It's just got a white screen at the moment. Yeah. It might be on like the last screen of the PowerPoint. And we saw it before. No, oh, yeah, we had it up before. Maybe it's just, oh. yeah. Yes. It's, yes, we're right. All right, okay. Okay. Do you want to just... Okay, um, we, I'll just talk. It's Chris. Um, and I'm just saying we'd like to acknowledge that we are speaking from the land of the Wajak people and acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution that they make to our land. Um, is this so you're seeing my whole screen, are you? Imogen. We, uh, if you if you click from current slide or from beginning, it should sort it out. Yeah, that looks yeah. How's that? Perfect. All right. So the question that we were given was um, that we've seen clients with family tax benefit decisions, so cancellation payments or rate reduction following a child support decision, usually around percentage of care. And clients are often confused about the interaction between child support and family tax benefit and how to challenge the decision. And the 
A brief was it would be beneficial for us to have a better understanding of the child support process, including child support assessments, how they're conducted, what evidence is required, the review process, and whether it's more beneficial for a person to challenge a child support assessment as opposed to challenging the decision under family assistance legislation. So Theresa's has obviously got the background of child support. Our knowledge and expertise is mainly in family assistance law and Centrelink's policies and procedures. Um, and so the comments that we're making about child support are really based on publicly available information, so the legislation and the guide, but we've had less experience dealing with child support. And I've just noted at the start, it's, it is a very complex area of law. There's a number of acts and policies that can impact on how child support or maintenance affects the amount of FTB that a person will receive. And to be honest, it's a difficult and technical topic compared to a lot of the earlier topics we've had today, which I think are far more interesting. However, we'll push on. We've got, we can circulate um, our slides at the end. We've got fact sheets at the end, like whatever people want, we can provide. Um, but I think it's important for us as if we're working in um, centres like ours to really understand how the systems work so that we can advise our clients. Um, and we can assess any family assistance decisions that have been made and form a view of um, whether they're correct. And we also would note that there's very few um, advocates and CLCs providing specialist advice about child support issues. Okay, it's Chris speaking. Um, I'm one of the cases, I've been a caseworker at Welfare Rights for many, many years and family tax benefit Part A is really affected by child support. And we often see that the perpetrators of domestic violence continue to use the child support system to disadvantage the, ex the victim. So one of the things that we often see is the person's only getting paid the base rate of family tax benefit, which is only about roughly $60 per fortnight per, for each child, when they should be getting often about 150. I'm giving in rough kind of figures, they're not exact. And the reason that they won't claim child support is because they're too fearful and they're scared of what will happen. And often they've been threatened by the person, their family, or friends of their family. One of the issues that recently came up was that the website did actually have a, a solution, which was a maintenance exemption. So I can apply for a maintenance exemption and I don't have to claim child support and I get the max, my maximum rate of family tax benefit. However, the Services Australia website has removed that information. And recently after a complaint, they put back that if you were concerned about claiming child support, you could contact Services Australia, which really, in my opinion, is not a very adequate response. However, so that's one issue that there's no information available and a lot of people don't understand that they can ask for a maintenance exemption. The other issue that we have, see all the time is there's a child support assessment, but the payer often is not paying the full amount so that the person's family tax benefit is based on the person paying them, say, $200 a week, and they're getting $50 a month. They don't want to complain because they're scared that the payer will either do something to them or do something to the children, or it's just too stressful to even go and tell someone this. One of the other things that people can do is to advise that they're getting a partial payment and ask for a maintenance exemption based on the partial payment. This is also another not widely known factor. Now, this is an ongoing one that we see in lots of our clients. The perpetrator continuously advises child support that they have an increasing percentage of care when they're not providing any care. So they ring up child support and say, oh, I now have 50% of my kids care. 
But what happens then if there's not any agreement, a written court agreement in place, the client, who is usually the woman in our case, has to prove that there hasn't been a change in the percentage of care. And the perpetrator can continue doing this regularly and there's no ability to stop this, right, unless they go to court and get a parenting order. I'm not a family tax benefit, a family lawyer or anything like that because people say they should go to the mediation and centre and see if they can make an agreement with the other party about the care of the children, but that's ridiculous. It doesn't happen. The other one we see is that the perpetrator continuously rings up child support and says they've made cash benefits for various items, you know. Often the person will think that they bought the kid a birthday present, right? But that's not what they've told child support. They've told child support that they paid $500 for whatever it was, a computer, a pair of shoes, God knows why, and that that is part of their maintenance payment. Um, our clients have not agreed to this. Um, it's often an unnecessary item. We had a client whose ex-partner wanted their son to wear a suit to a wedding. Their son was four years old and spent, I don't know, $600 on this suit and claimed that as a cash payment. We've also had clients whose children have got computers or things that they can only use at the ex-partner's house. They can't use them. And they try to claim that as child support payments. This may often go on over many, many years and it wears people down, continuously having to argue and object to this issue. Okay, the other one is that the person <coughs> is, re receives no child support for the whole year and their family tax benefit payments are based on what they're getting. They're under the disbursement method. And then the perpetrator pays all the maintenance in the last month of the financial year. And because the family tax benefit debt is based on a family tax benefit is based on yearly income, you know, financial year, how much maintenance you got, the person ends up with a debt. The other one I won't talk about is the tax return because that's been covered quite a lot. Um, and the other thing is that we often have is where the perpetrator rings up the Centrelink tip-off line and says the person's working, shouldn't be entitled to their family tax benefit payment or they're a member of a couple and they've got masses of income. These are things that people often have to contend with and it really impacts on their family tax benefit. All right. Um, so there's obviously decisions made by different um, departments or the family court that can all be relevant. So child support are making decisions about the entitlement to be paid, who's the payer. They're making decisions about assessments, uh, collection of child support, what counts as child support and child support debts. Family court is relevant because they're making decisions about varying or setting aside or, or the original formal, uh, sorry, bearing or setting aside formal child support agreements and about child support arrears um, and some other relevant things, as well as obviously the parenting orders in the first place that set out percentages of care. Um, Services Australia or Family Assistance Office, we'll call them Centrelink, um, are making decisions about entitlement to FTB, relationships or Part A, uh, relationship status, percentage of care and then the rate of FTBA and about FTB debts. Okay. So Centrelink have a maintenance action test, which we've spoken about briefly before, that you have to apply for the to child support for an assessment or get a maintenance exemption. Um, so this can be problematic when the other parent denies they are the child's parent because child support will not accept the assessment. 
So what then has to happen is that the person has to usually go to legal aid in West Australia and get them to advise whether they can do a DNA testing or whether it's not, it's too expensive to get the DNA testing and they need to write a letter to Centrelink advising that the person's taking this action and the person can continue to get paid the maximum rate of child support. Yeah, oh, FTV, <laughs> sorry, FTV, my brain. That's right. Um, there, so the, this is, we're going through the ways child support can affect rates of FTBA. Um, so then the maintenance income test, uh, which includes the amount in the assessment, and that's unless the person's on the disbursement method or has a maintenance exemption. Um, payments collected by child support, non-agency payments that Chris was talking about, that the payer says they've paid or non-cash housing maintenance, capitalised maintenance or spousal maintenance. Okay. There are three ways that people can receive their child support, if they get any, that is. They can self-manage it. This means that the people determine between each other who how it's going to be paid. Normally those people will not be on a Centrelink payment or on receiving family tax benefit. Private collect, um, this is where the other party, like the ex-partner pays, normally the woman who has the child, the payments. There are lots of problems with that um, and there's no oversight of that amount of money. And so they may not get any money, they may get the full amount. It depends on what the paying parent feels like paying. Where there's family and domestic violence, this is unlikely to be the best option. However, we see frequently that child support use private collect as the default place. They say, well, you've not got any problems. The person doesn't know they're going to have problems. Then you should just go and private collect. The other issue is that we're seeing is clients who have had family and domestic violence have gone to child support, but the payer has been paying regularly, right? And so they say to them, oh, there's no problems now. We've now put you on private collect without any consultation. You've just got a letter in the mail. This is really problematic and the person has to then lodge an objection to this action to child support. The other thing is child support collect. This affects the person's, it affects all of it. Child support affects their rate of FTB and how it's assessed when child support collected is child support do an assessment and if the person is on the modified entitlement method, this is a nightmare, which is the default method, Centrelink assess it that the person is getting the amount the child support have assessed they should, regardless of whether they're getting it or not. The person has, if the person is not getting paid their proper rate or they're getting random payments, they actually need to ask Centrelink to assess it under the disbursement method. The disbursement method is where you get paid your family tax benefit based on what child support you actually physically get. However, previously you used to get told the options, but nowadays, unless you know about it or look on the website, it is actually being made now and understand that you've got to make these decisions about how child support collection affects your family tax benefit payment, you will often be not getting any child support and being assessed as if you were getting child support and paid less. So that's a really big issue that we see. Um, and it seems to have been changed because prior to this, you were given the options. But in the last couple of years, you're not told anything. Um, so the other way that child support can affect a person's rate is um, around mandatory continuous adjustment. 
So if a potential overpayment is identified during a financial year due to, amongst other things, an increase in your maintenance assessment or the payment of child support arrears, then your rate of FTB will be reduced for the remainder of the year to minimise the risk of a debt once the reconciliation is done. Okay. The other issue that I did touch on before is decisions about the percentage of care each person has. This is really relevant because it depends on how much your percentage of care affects if you have to pay child support and whether you're entitled to family tax benefit part A. So on the slide, if, you, if it's 13% or less, you're required to pay child support at the full rate and not entitled to family tax benefit. 14 to 34% child support is based on your percentage of care, but you're not entitled to family tax benefit. 35 to 65% amount of child support required to be paid is based on a percentage of care and there is an entitlement to family tax benefit and 60 to 100, that person who's got that percentage is not required to pay child support and entitled to receive 100% of the family tax benefit. This percentage of care decision is really important and it's why a lot of people have um, fights over their percentage of care because it's about how much will I get and how much will I have to pay in child support. And there are numerous AAT decisions, if you look on the internet, about people disputing their percentages of care. Um, and why the issue about where do you request a review is important is because um, from uh, July 2010, an assessment of care, percentage of care made by either Centrelink for family assistance purposes or child support for their assessment has effect for the other agency in relation to care periods that begin after that date. And the guide, so there's obviously a child support guide as well as a family assistance guide, state that both uh, child support and Centrelink use the same rules to verify shared care. But in our experience, um, the uh, Centrelink uh, appear to do a, a better job of actually looking into a statement that a percentage of care has changed. <coughs> no, no, yeah, well, yeah, it's changed. If, and we are being gender biased here again, it, normally the man is paying the majority, is paying the child support, right? So they ring up child support agency and say the percentage of care has changed. And so then the child support agency normally sends the client a letter. Often the client doesn't get the letter for about a month. And at that point in time, she also realises she's getting less child support and she's also getting less family tax benefit. Now, she then rushes into Centrelink and Centrelink say child support have made the decision. However, the issue is Centrelink can review it. Her ex-partner, the person who's paying her child support, can't ask Centrelink to review any decision unless he's getting part of the family tax benefit. He can only ask child support to review it. However, Centrelink take the position that whoever made the decision is the person that is the agency that has to review it. Child support have only 28 days from when the decision was made to lodge an objection or an appeal. And Centrelink, there's no actual real time limit. Yeah. Um, and so obviously the review process with, if you're going through uh, to appeal the decision about your rate of FTB is to go to the authorised review officer. Um, there are lots of, uh, as Chris says, there's no time limit. There are rules about date of effect. Um, 
And they are complex because if an arrow, for example, makes a decision about percentage of care, which then will apply for child support purposes, there's different date of effect rules for child the child support. support and the registrar of child support will decide when that takes effect from. We're not going to go into all of that now. Um, but with, with Centrelink uh, looking at reviews, they really should be looking at all the evidence that can be provided by either party that's affected by the decision. Um, and they do uh, traditionally look at things like, um, you know, proof of attendance at schools and receipts and uh, close family, friends and relatives doing support letters as well as other members of the community. Um, information from other uh, doctors. doctors, DCP, uh, child protection, if they're involved. Child, um, we don't see that level of scrutiny of these decisions at child at a child support level. No. This may be because traditionally um, Centrelink have done these reviews and looked at shared care, as it's called, over many years. They also have social workers who are quite involved in the decisions. They may have the migrant service officer may look at it or the Indigenous customer service officer may look at it. We don't actually really know what happens with child support, but from the decisions that we see from our clients who've actually lodged an objection, it's normally very basic information, which doesn't actually say why they made the decision. It just says we've, re we've reviewed your objection and the decision stands. Um, the, we normally see them. We don't do child support appeals or objections. And they're the one thing that makes Centrelink letters look good, I think, is comparing them to <laughs> child support <laughs> letters. Um, but you can obviously have an objection dealt with by the registrar of the child support um, agency and then a person who disagrees with either an authorised review officer's officer decision or the registrar's decision can then go through to the um, Social Security and Child Support Division of the AAT. Um, and then again, there's a lot of technical rules about if, a, if the AAT one has already looked at an appeal from an arrow, um, under family assistance legislation then, and they've made a decision about percentage of care, then someone who's objected to a child support decision can't take that same issue back to the AAT one. Um, they would only be able to look at maybe date of effect or some other aspect of the decision that's not about percentage of care. Um, and then there's a, a review on from there to uh, the general division. However, if you're not aware of it, you may have missed your 28-day time limit to appeal to the general division. Um, yeah, so I think that's all the detail. <laughs> I was trying to think of a polite way of describing it, but we're obviously happy to uh, answer questions, um, whatever. Thanks so much, Catherine, Chris, Terry. Um, it just struck me how mind-bendingly complex the interaction of the systems is and that we barely understand it. How do <laughs> the people who need to live off child support or Centrelink payments understand it? Um, so we do have some questions. The first one is for Therese. What is the main reason for the lack of political will to ensure that child support is paid and collected? Okay, thank you for the question. And also thank you to Chris and Catherine. It was such a good presentation. It's hard when you've got the, the, deep, the technical details. So this is a guess. If I absolutely knew this answer, I would drive right through it and, um, and put it into action. But, but part of my love of child support has me doing my PhD in it. And one of the things that I'm doing is interviewing those policy architects, the people who got the child support system into place in the first time. So when we often think about social issues, we sort of see it in a, a, a left 
right political spectrum. I would say this is a real gender spectrum. So we find that um, that conservative history tells us because of the amount of inquiries and the terms of reference that have happened since the enactment of the scheme, that the conservative side of politics are very responsive to the men's groups. Um, there is something a bit um, uncomfortable about supporting single mother families. After all, they did leave a, a um, two parent family. So, so of course they should undergo some sort of punishment for that. But then we get in the progressive side of, of politics and we still have, you know, they, they often have the blue um, collar workers. So until we have a greater, my, my belief is, until we have a, um, until we look at it through a gendered lens and that women's economic security is elevated, I think we are chipping away and chipping away. So we are trying to find a champion of the child support scheme. Um, and I, so I think it, it, it extends beyond the normal, the normal left right sort of thing. And also, um, you know, politicians don't want to poke the bear too much. Um, and, and over the years, there has been, we should be all uncomfortable about this, but there is a comfortable level around single mums having poverty and hardship. And that's what we've got to agitate. So my view is that it's a gender related issue. And until we really talk seriously about gender, um, it can sort of slip under the mat. To that person who asked that question, thank you. And we will try really hard to, um, to force it on the uh, political table well the next question is a really good follow-on from that about whether you see the job summit as an opportunity to up the ante on all of this and the need for cross-portfolio reforms to improve income security for single mothers yeah sure in fact i've written my briefing paper i use every opportunity to put child support on the table and um, I try and match it so it's there, so it, it, there is a, a policy logic to it. But in this one, where I've been taught, so my, what I've already sent through, I talk about unpaid care. And in the child support, so when child support first came in, there was a component for to acknowledge the direct and indirect cost and the penalties around um, undertaking unpaid care. And when the child support system first came in, it, there was an amount for women that was the equivalent of um, the, the, the average wage. Late 1980s, it was reduced. And strap yourself in for this, under John Howard in 2008, it was completely removed. So that really then changed the formula because the formula spurts out what you put in. So, so not having any unpaid care in that child support formula really changed, changed the levels. So one of um, our requirements is to actually put care back into national policies and one of our leading recommendations is the child support agency uh, child support scheme and i actually did point in my briefing paper that it was a time when very patriarchal policies were dominant and we were gender blind i'm sure as much as the social security system is outdated in relying on those <laughs> gender stereotypes um, the child support system even more so. Um, the final question is from Chloe from JRS Finding Safety. What would you recommend to a woman who is on a temporary visa, not a partner visa, is a survivor of domestic and family violence and would like to secure child support from an uncooperative ex-partner? Catherine and Chris, do you want to answer that? And um, well done on being a survivor. So I'll just 
just send you over that way to the technical experts? Look, I, I don't know that there's an easy answer. It, um, it depends on, from our perspective, it would depend on was the woman safe, right? Because you need to look at if she claims child support, is she safe? Is she going to be able to be safe or is he or his family going to find her? Mm -hmm. So I think you need to start from that basis first. No amount of money is going to help you if you're not safe. Um, and I suppose if we've already discussed in those previous sessions, if you've got lack of access to things like um, refuges or um, uh, other accommodation services, um, then it's going to be more problematic. And the other thing too is if you're not entitled to get family tax benefit, right, for your child, um, you may be entitled to get special benefit for your child. But with special benefit, one of the things that wasn't raised is that the person still has to claim child support to be eligible for special benefit for their child. If they don't feel safe and safety is the main concern, then they should see the social worker about getting a maintenance exemption to exempt them from that situation. However, I raise another issue, right, in these cases, and we do raise them with various clients. If you are totally safe and you need more money, then you need to see a lawyer and some lawyers we see regularly and you need to claim spousal maintenance. Sorry, I say this because spousal maintenance is included in the income test for family tax benefit. But if you're not getting family tax benefit and you probably won't get special benefit in a hurry and you're totally safe, claim spousal maintenance. Um, you need a good lawyer to do it good family lawyer, but we have had a number of clients who've claimed spousal maintenance and got it enforced by the court on their ex-partner's wages. So I just bring that up as a side issue. Thank you, Chris. Well, that wraps it up for this session. And I think what we're hearing is how important it is that people can access legal services and other support services in order to be able to navigate these crazily complex systems. And most people will never actually access one of our services, either because they don't know about them or because um, we don't have the resources to help everyone who needs it. So we'll be going to uh, the Jobs Summit later this week and flying the flag. Um, Therese, you'll be there as well, won't you? I'm flag flying as well. <laughs> um, so we'll be um, making all of these points um, wherever we can at the Jobs Summit. Thank you, Therese, Catherine, Chris. Uh, I will now wrap up the day. It's been a very long day and as a testament to um, the quality of the speakers, we've almost kept everyone on the line. Um, the entire day. Um, you are going to get shortly an email if you haven't already asking just two questions. One, to provide us the star rating for the day. And secondly, if you have any comments or suggestions for us to pop them in a box that will allow us to you know, look to our next conference and work out how to improve. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Last but not least, I want to make some thank you to Imogen Bracken from CLC New South Wales. Thank you so much for helping us make sure all the tech ran smoothly today. And to my team who just worked so hard to make this a really fantastic day, Linda, Emily, and Lucia, who organised the whole conference while studying law at UTS and on seven hours a week. All of you have had contact with her and she's just done an amazing job. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.